Christ, he ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown Good Sunday morning, friends, and welcome to church this Sunday morning. I'm just coming out of the door of the old Mill Creek Baptist Church as it was established in 1798. It was established here near the present-day town of Tompkinsville, which is in Monroe County, Kentucky. But at the time, it was Barron County. And so this church, we're going to see a good bit of, good bit of history. And the building that, uh, that is behind me is one of the oldest existing church buildings uh, in uh, the state of Kentucky. This building was built in 1804. Uh, the, the pastor that, that came to be the pastor in a, about that, that year of 1804 was John Mulkey. And this, this church has, a, has an important history both in the region and within several uh, denominations and some non-denominations uh, where we see uh, in 1809 the, the church divides. Uh, some staying with the Baptists and some staying with what they believe to be a more New Testament model for the church. Uh, it became known unofficially as the Old Mulkey Meeting House. The building itself is, is built in, in, in the shape of a cross. The inside the, 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 the pulpit area inside juts out slightly. Uh, the door on the other side juts out a little. It has three doors signifying the Trinity. It has the 12 walls then signifying the 12 apostles. Here in the cemetery, uh, to, my, to my side, we have uh, several Revolutionary War soldiers buried. We have Hannah Boone, the sister of Daniel Boone, buried here. This built, church built in 1804 is one of, uh, of a few still in existent buildings that we have here in the state of Kentucky. Perhaps the oldest still in existence is, uh, is Cane Ridge Meeting House, which was built in 1791. Join us this day from this historic place for worship. Guide me, O my great Redeemer, pilgrims through this barren land. I am weak, but ye are mighty. Hold me with your powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me now and evermore. Feed me now and evermore. Open now the crystal fountain where the healing waters flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillar lead me all my journeys through. Strong deliver, strong deliver, ever be my strength and shield, ever be my strength and shield. 
When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fear subside. Death of death and hell's destruction, land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises, songs of praises, I will ever sing to thee. I will ever sing to thee. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The psalm that I've chosen for today, as we've done in the past weeks, we are, we are taking the psalms in a sequential order. So Psalm 10, hear the word of the Lord. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the greedy one for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws them into his net. He, the helpless, are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten he has hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. Let's begin our service this morning with prayer. Join with me. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, again, as we stand in your presence, in a place where your gospel has been preached throughout the generations, Father, we, we come to adore you, to love you, to cast our faults and sins before you, to, to come and ask for the forgiveness of those sins, to come and turn our hearts and minds to you, that we may know you in your fullness, that we may know you in your love, mercy, and grace. So, Father, guide and direct this day is my prayer, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Join with us this morning in a hymn to the Lord. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living One, His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that He 
died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves, this is my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Saviour's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. This morning, again, as we are gathered as the church, I invite you to bring your prayer requests and bring them to the Lord. There are, there are uh, many that have lost loved ones in, in this past week and, and months, and we want to pray for their comfort. We do want to pray for, for those that are seeking the Lord, that the Lord will make himself real in a, a mighty way, that, that he will in no misunderstandable terms be able to to offer the assurance that he does through his faith in him and through his word so as we continue in our service let's pause and let's pray gracious and loving heavenly father again we do come to you we bring our requests to you we we thank you where you hear and answer prayer we have seen uh, in our friends in the in the last months and in our own family we've seen you answer the prayer of of the need necessity of of the surgery that you have spoken clearly and you have preserved things so father we we do come to you glorifying you and asking that as we all pour our hearts out before you this sunday morning that you do hear and that you answer prayer we think in particular of a friend that uh, spent uh, a night in the hospital not knowing exactly what the issue was. And we want to pray for this family as, as they struggle and go forth. We pray for healing. We pray for healing for knees. We pray for healing for, for marriages, for, for, for families. We pray for your healing in all things. And we do this in the name of Christ. Amen. Our epistle for this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 18 through 24. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation wakes in, in eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth unto now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are, were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Our gospel 
reading for this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 6, verses 36 through 45. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into the pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye and do not take notice of the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck that is out that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck that is in your brother's eye. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good measure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks and can it be that i should gain an interest in the savior's blood died he for me who caused his pain for me who him to death pursued amazing love how can it be that thou my god should die for me amazing love how can it be that thou my god should die for me he left his father's throne above so free so infinite his grace empty himself of all but love and bled for adam's helpless race tis mercy all immense and free for oh my god it found out me amazing love how can it be that thou my god should die for me no condemnation now i dread Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through christ my own amazing love how can it be that thou my god should die for me our message for this morning is is coming from the 12th chapter of acts as we have been uh, want to do in the last weeks, we have been studying Acts and we are going sequentially through the book of Acts uh, on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights. 
And as we come to the 12th chapter here, we are, we are going to see uh, an important narrative that much like standing in front of a historic site, on the ground of a historic site, where, where we can read back in history 220 years ago or so, and, and, and we can understand what took place here. We can understand the, the divisions that took place here. We can understand the unity that took place here. We can read of the gospel that was, that was preached here. And we can do that by putting it into our own modern albeit 20, 200 years ago, uh, context. Well, Scripture is, is really no different in that, in that most of Scripture, or in, here at least in the book of Acts, Luke is, uh, is taking the opportunity of giving us hints as to exactly when this is taking place. So as we, as we read through the Scripture, much like we would uh, of of any other, any other history. We want to know where, when, who were the players, and, and how, does that, how does that fit into uh, our narrative and our understanding of Scripture. We're in Acts 12, and as, as I said, we're, we're looking at events now that have been recorded that are about 12 to 15 years uh, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts 12. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who were belonging to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the temple. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now what are we, what are we seeing here? We are seeing uh, Herod uh, Agrippa. It is mentioning, mentioning him about this, about this time, Herod the king. Herod Agrippa the first, uh, he is the grandson of Herod the Great. Do you remember, you remember Herod the Great? Do you remember when he ruled? He was ruling during the time of Jesus' birth. Uh, he is the one that, that received the wise men from the east and said, go and find this king that is uh, being, being born and then come back and, and tell me about it. He, his motive was to then find this, this, young, this young lad, this young babe, and, and put him to death because he wanted no other, no other king. Well, was this unusual for, for Herod the Great? No, no, they're in, they're in his family. He killed the father of Herod Agrippa, Herod Agrippa I. The grandfather killed his son. Uh, and he did this about, about 7 B.C. because he was afraid that he might arise and usurp the throne. So four years later, he hears of another king. He hears of a prophecy of a king. And, and when those are gathering to, to, to find and worship him out of the jealousy and, and the fear in his heart, he, he, he desires to be able to put, to put this to death. Well, what, what of the grandson then? The grandson is alive at that time. And, and he, is, he is sent uh, to Rome with his mother. And there he is uh, reared and educated among the children of the Roman aristocracy. We're going to see Herod Agrippa being made king of a, a bit of land there in, in Israel uh, by Caligula, who was the emperor at the time, who would have been a, a, an acquaintance of his during, during their, during their formative, formative years. And as things progress, he's given a little more and a little more responsibility until finally he is, he is given uh, the, the ability to be over the entirety of, of this as the king of the Jews. Uh, this, is, this is interesting. Herod, Herod the Great would have been considered the king of the Jews. And here now his, his grandson also would bear that, that title. What's the year? It's in, it's in the, early, the early 40s. And that, that he comes to power, that we see, we see these things taking place. Uh, and, then, and then we hear of, of Herod 
laying violent hands on some of the Christians. And this is the wording that, that various uh, translations of, of, of Scripture use. And in that, he takes James, the brother of, of, Jesus, uh, of John, and potentially a cousin of Jesus. Uh, there's some connection given between, between John and James' mother and, and, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, of them being, being siblings. Uh, so we, we, we see a very, a very close, close connection there. James, James the Greater, James the one that is, that is called uh, by, by Jesus in the beginning of his ministry, the, the brother of, of John, who we know is the beloved disciple. And, and, and they, they serve along, and, and they, they are like the other disciples in that they, they misinterpret some of the things. Uh, their mother comes to Jesus not long before the crucifixion and says, says uh, grant that my sons will set one on your right hand and one on your, on your left in, in, in glory. And, and Jesus gives then a prophecy that he said they indeed will follow me. And James is the first one to then be martyred. Yeah, the scripture says that, that Herod killed him with, with a sword. Now we have one of two things happening there. Again, I, I find this, this history fascinating as, as I speak to, to others that I, that I know love history. That, that to die by the sword in a Roman manner would be, would be beheading. But this would not have been a thing preferable to the Jews who would have uh, struck and, and perhaps impaled a person upon, upon the sword. Them, them thinking that, that beheading not to be, not to be something to, uh, uh, to be desired. Uh, so they, uh, whatever, the, whatever the means, he, he, he kills James and, and, the, and the, the Jewish people, the ones that are outside of the, the circle of believers. How many believers are there now? Oh, that, would be, that would be difficult to say given the rapid growth of the early church. We're easily, easily into 10,000 plus, uh, probably even even more. And we are seeing the church spread uh, amongst, amongst the, the area, amongst the known world. So one question that comes to mind as, as we read these, these first five verses, it says very plainly in, in verse five that, that the church made earnest prayer for Peter while he was in prison. Did they not pray for James? I'm sure they did. But after seeing the result of James' imprisonment, which was, which was something new for the, for the apostles, this martyrdom, while they had seen Stephen martyred, the, this was, this was a, a, a new thing for the inner circle, those 12 apostles. So this brought the church into the action of praying sincerely. Did they lose faith because James had died? The, the scripture doesn't, doesn't indicate that. But, but they, they do pray earnestly. Peter, what, what, do we, what, do we see, what do we see of him there? He is given, he, he's arrested just before the, the days of unleavened bread. This is Passover. And, and he's put in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers. Each squad had, had four soldiers. So he has 16 soldiers to guard him. He want, they want to be sure that, that Peter is there so that when they can bring him out of prison, uh, he will not have escaped in, in some, some fashion. Verse 6, then we see this narrative. And this is a, this is a narrative that as, as we've grown up in the church, those of us that have and attended children's church and attended Sunday schools uh, in places much like those behind me, this, this, is a, this is a narrative that would be preached upon and told. Verse 6, now when Herod was about to bring him out, that is on the night before uh, the end of, of, of Passover, on that very night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and, and light shone in the cell. And he, uh, the angel, struck Peter on the side and woke him up and said, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And Peter did that. 
And then the angel said to him, as if the angel is having to prod him at every turn here, because what Peter thinks is that perhaps he is seeing a vision. Not that he is seeing this in reality. Get up, dress yourself, put on your sandals, put your cloak around you and follow me. And as he went out and followed him, he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. Verse 10, when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them. It opened for them on its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people were expecting. Now, Luke here, I think, uses a bit of humor uh, in, in emphasizing that that, that the angel has to strike him on the side. Get up, Peter, wake up, uh, and, and instruct him every step of, of the way. Put your sandals on, put your cloak on, get dressed, let's go, follow, follow me. And, and while this is, this is remarkable, one lesson that I, that I draw from this is, is, is I, am, I am one that wants to look at a narrative of Scripture, and I want to see, I want to see how how it works out. Uh, is, this, is this miraculous? Or is this perceived as miraculous? Well, during the book of Acts, during the Gospels, we have miraculous things happening one after another. And these things are happening so that we can understand who Christ is and the power that He has and the power that He has over our situation here. So when, when we pray, Lord, Lord, help me in this, in this situation, and then when we see things suddenly change to our advantage, do we recognize it as being God's work? Or are we in a trance like Peter, and we're stumbling along, going, okay, get up, put your shoes on, put your coat on, let's, let's go, let's, let's, do, let's do this thing. What happened to Peter was miraculous, but it is given to us within the context of Scripture. Now, there are many during the times uh, that, that this church was being uh, established that, that, that one would have said there is no God, much like the psalm that I, that I read. There would be others that were saying, well, there, there's a God, but, but He doesn't care about us. And he, uh, he, he wound the timepiece, as it were, and put it on the clock and is just waiting for it to wind down. And he has no interaction with us. But we are like Peter. We are like Peter in that, in that the miraculous happens around us. We pray for something. We, my dear wife and I, prayed this week that the Lord's will be done regarding her surgery, and, 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 and we prayed earnestly, desiring that, that this be a situation that, that would do no harm. And the Lord answered the prayer. And we see this uh, and recognize this as, as a miraculous thing. We, we, see, we see other people, we see other times in our lives where, where the Lord has, has heard and answered prayer. We also see other times where the Lord has allowed someone to, to perish. James was allowed to perish. We don't know, we don't know the, the reasoning behind all of that. We don't know all of, all of the intricacies of it. But we see God's hand in all these, these things. So as, as we pray, as we pray, we, we, we do pray with, with faith. We pray earnestly to God. Do you see the language there? We pray to the Lord. Uh, and this is, this is where our prayer goes. And, and we do see the miraculous take place. Verse 12. When he realized where he was, when he woke up and he realized the miraculous thing. Miraculous, these soldiers are, are trained. 
These soldiers know that if this prisoner escapes, whatever punishment that prisoner was destined to suffer would be their own fate. And indeed, we'll find in the scripture that, that, that Herod is going to send, he's going to question these, these 16, and he's going to end up putting them, putting them to death. But when, when Peter realized all that, had, all that had taken place, he realized the miracle, walking through doors that opened, through gates that opened, chains falling off his hands. He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. John Mark we're going to see in the upcoming narratives. And many were gathered there and they were praying. Who were they praying for? They were praying for Peter. And Peter knocks on the door. Now the intricacy of the story is, is marvelous in that we know the name of the servant girl. We know that Rhoda went to answer the door. She heard the knock on the door and surely she looked out through the through the window or said, said, who is this? And he said, this is me, I'm, I'm, I'm Peter. Open up the door for me. And, and she, in her surprise, runs back. She recognizes Peter's voice and she runs back but didn't open the door and reported that Peter was standing at the gate and they said to her, you're out of your mind. They were praying for a miracle but not expecting a miracle. Is this not where we find ourselves at times? But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is, it is his angel. And again, this is an indication of, of the belief of, of Judaism at that time, that, that they believed that, that when a person died, that their, their, their angel, their spirit, uh, stayed for a, a short time there with them. But she goes back, she opens the door, she brings Peter in, and he motions to them to be quiet because you can understand perhaps the joy at which at which they greeted him and he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison he gave a testimony he said brothers and sisters this is where I was locked this is where I was chained this is where the Lord found me and the Lord came and He released those chains off my arms, off my legs. And He said to me, get up and follow me. And as I went out of that prison, the doors opened, the gates opened, and I found myself free. Here's the thing that is happening right here in history, A.D. 42, 43, 44, along in there. Well, well it's a three-year span, Parson. Can't you be any more specific than that? 2,000 years ago? Can you remember three years ago? Absolutely. I think it was yesterday. But we, we, see, this, we see this happening. We see one that is, that is faithful. He has preached the Word of God, but he finds himself in prison. I see many of us that find ourselves in prison. We're locked in a situation that we feel that we cannot get out of. I mean, it's, it's impossible. Is it possible for, for, for me to save myself? Lord, you're there and I'm, I'm here, but I'm chained inside this prison cell. Sixteen soldiers are surrounding me. My sin is holding me fast. And I can't do a thing to get rid of it. And the church is praying for me. And the church is praying for you. For we all in our sin find ourselves in that, in that situation. And then miracle of miracles. Jesus Christ went to the cross. And He died in our place to suffer the penalty that we are due. Who's chained us here? Satan has chained us here. Who is holding us in this, in this place? Our unbelief, our sin is holding us in this, in this place. But when we believe, our chains fall off and we find ourselves free. 
and here we are, we're, we're, we're standing now in, in, in a prison, no chains on our feet, no chains on our arms, uh, the, the, the guard seemingly, seemingly asleep in the power of God Himself. And He says, put on your clothes and follow me. What did Jesus say to, to those that he, that he healed? There was a paralytic that was let down through the, uh, through the roof of a house into Jesus' presence. And, he, and he, first he says, your sins are forgiven. And they go, oh, now nobody but God can forgive sins. And he says, okay, to prove that I am who I say that I am, take up your bed and walk. Come out of that, come out of that situation and move forward with the Lord. And this is what he is calling us to do. And this is, is, is one of, of many lessons that are, uh, that are here in, in this scripture. In, you know, on Wednesday night, we're going to talk about, about the ending of, of Herod Agrippa I and how he, he, he met his earthly, earthly end. But, but today, today in time, I want you to look around. I want you to see the chains that, that hold, hold us bound. I want you to see the sin that is in our lives. And we must confess this. We must confess Jesus is Lord. We must repent and turn and follow Him. This is what happened to the crowds here at the Old Mulkey Meeting House. This is what happened here to the crowds at the Mill Creek Baptist Church. They turned and they followed Christ. What do we do? What do we do when we find ourselves then suddenly, suddenly and miraculously free? But we go to where the church is gathered and we give testimony to what the Lord has done for us. Now last week I talked about revival. I talked about revival in 1800 that affected this area. We're as the crow flies were 60 or so miles away from the Red River Meeting House now. But as, as we see revival moving, we see people converted, changed, set free from their sinful selves to follow the Lord. And where did they go? They went to the Meeting House. They went to the church. They went to where the Christians were gathered and they said, let me tell you about how the Lord brought me out of prison. Are you still bound? Are you free? Today is the day of salvation. Will you come to the Lord? Pray with me this morning. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we begin our prayers that way. You, you, you instruct us in some ways, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But Father, we come to you giving our allegiance, acknowledging who you are, that you are God and we are not. That, that you are not the one chained, that you are not the one held back, but we are lost and chained in our sinful conditions. We are distracted by the world that goes uh, and things that go on around us. And so we come to you. Wake us up. Just like you woke up Peter. Strike us on the side. Sometimes that's necessary. Sometimes a little pain in, uh, instilled helps us to come to our senses and to see the chains fall off and to be able to walk with you to freedom, to glory forever and ever. Lead and guide us is my prayer this morning. Call us to be true followers of you, Christians, as they called those in the city of Antioch. Heavenly Father, I'm, I'm grateful for those that have gathered with me this Sunday morning, uh, knowledgeable of where they are, many of them, in their pain and suffering and grief and asking that you heal, that you lead, and that you guide. But most of all, may we follow you in faith. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Our benediction for today comes from Ephesians, the sixth chapter. The last two verses of that chapter. 
the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. Peace be to you, brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Amen and amen. May the Lord be with you all. Thank you.